Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is David Martinez. I will be serving as today's moderator. And on behalf of the Amarillo Branch NAACP, uh, we'd like to welcome everyone to the 2021 Municipal Candidate Forum. Uh, joining us today are Chuck Williams from KGNC and also Penny Commit from KFDA. Before we begin, I just wanna say thank you to all the candidates who, have, who are joining us uh, this morning and for your commitment to serve our city. We know that running for a public, public office is not an easy chore and we most certainly appreciate you. So without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, up first, we have the first one candidates, uh, Mr. Jason Tillery. Good morning. Obert Gunny Brown and Mr. Cole Stanley. And at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Chuck Williams from KGNC with our first question for y'all. Okay, we'll wait for Mr. Williams in just a second. Um, I'll go ahead and ask the first question. This is to our place one candidates. Uh, the first question is for Mr. Jason Tillery. Uh, what, if anything, could have been done on the local level to lessen the number of COVID-related deaths? Yeah, you know, honestly, I thought about that question. I honestly don't know what could have been done. I think the city handled it well. I think private businesses handled it well. And I think most importantly, I think people in the community handled it well by taking preventative measures to ensure that uh, we didn't spread the back, you know, the virus. And I think people I think people did well. So honestly, I don't know what could have been done to lessen the deaths. I know we have a fairly low death rate. So I think all in all, from city leaders to business leaders to private citizens, I think we handled it very well. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Oh, I'm sorry. I said, yes, sir. Okay, Mr. Hobart Gunny Brown, same question to you. What, if anything, could have been done on the local level to lessen the number of COVID related deaths? Well. I have thought about that question over and over again. Ever since I have decided to run for a city council, that question that came up many times. And one thing I drew back on was that, uh, first off, I, I drew back from my, my military experience. You know, I, I have taken Marines into battle and I have left Marines in foreign countries. And, you know, as, as the one in charge, I did the best I could have done with the information that I had. And that's exactly what our city officials did. They did the best they could with the information that they had, the guidelines that they had in any place. One thing about this pandemic is, is that uh, we're talking the local level, but when you have the media, the, the conspiracy theorists, you have all these groups out there and everything, it's a no-win situation. And it's the same thing, like I was saying at the beginning with me going into battle with my Marines and everything. Yeah, I can second guess myself all day long, but at the end, I did the best I had to do. And I apologize to those parents that uh, for the Marines that I left behind, but I got to keep on moving. And that's what we need to do with this pandemic. We need to quit looking backwards and start moving forward. Thank you, sir. Mr. Cole Stanley. Hey, good morning, guys. <clears throat> I, uh, I feel uh, like it, to you. Go ahead. Yes, sir. I feel like it'd be a mistake to uh, look at this and say, what could we have done? I think it's more, what should we still be doing? So um, twofold in that one, we, we were given data that we had to base our decisions on that was with COVID deaths and from COVID deaths. And so if we had been better at isolating those two portions of data, we would have been able to make better diagnoses of those that needed different types of treatment. It'd be a mistake to say that there's one solution for this uh, problem. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, 
these these two military experts that that are officers that are running against me know that a good offense um, is important. So immunities, building your immunities from the inside out, not relying on masks, not relying on strictly sanitation um, or sanitization, not relying on keeping everyone away from from you, but but building your immunities from the inside out. So a good diet, good exercise, lots of vitamin D, lots of vitamin E and C. Um, and then the therapeutics that we were given that we know about um, promoting those, uh, hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin. Um, ivermectin has over 800 peer reviewed articles with a 100% success rate for anything that, pardon me, that was an Amber Alert, for anything that, uh, that was caught uh, preemptively. So if it did not progress into your lungs and turn into pneumonia, uh, ivermectin had a 100% success rate at defeating uh, the COVID-19 virus. Okay, thank you for your response. Sir. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mrs. Penny Commit from KFDA. She is going to be asking our place one candidates some user, uh, excuse me, viewer questions. Uh, Mrs. Commit, go ahead. Well, thank you so much for having me. Let me start off with that. And David Martinez, wonderful first question. It kind of leads into my second one. Many of our businesses, especially those downtown that were relying on, you know, the warm weather, the Hodgetown season last season to kind of pick their business up, were really hurt during this pandemic. Many small business owners that I've had the privilege of speaking to with my role at KFDA News Channel 10, I would like to ask all the candidates, we can start with um, Mr. Brown. How do you feel our main street, our downtown is? Do you believe it's healthy and successful? And if not, what would you do to change that and get these small downtown businesses back on their feet? Well, when you ask the question, is it healthy and successful? What is the, what is the end goal? What, what are we really trying to accomplish downtown? I mean, right now, when you look at the downtown, all you really, to the naked eye, all you focus on is the baseball field and business down there. Are we trying to build commerce? Are we trying to upgrade the retails? And if we are trying to build re more retail space down there, what are we doing to get that retail space down there? So the definition of healthy and vibrant, that's, that's a very bold question. I mean, it's a very wide question. I mean, right now, everything that I need downtown is downtown, but to, you know, we could probably ask each one of the other panelists here about something downtown. There's probably something missing downtown there. So right now, my personal opinion, downtown is vibrant. It's growing. We're, 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 we're very focused on downtown. And um, as a future city council member and everything, I, I just don't want to focus on downtown. I want to focus on 6th Street as well get that to just as vibrant at the downtown. So, so to answer your question, I'm gonna say yes, but there's more work that needs to be done throughout the city. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Um, I'll hand it over to Mr. Stanley. Uh, yes, ma'am. So <clears throat> I enjoy what we've done downtown. Uh, I like going down there. I like the restaurants. I like uh, Polk Street, uh, but I'm a big fan of old buildings and reclaiming uh, historic structures. And so um, I would agree that, that like with Gunny saying, you know, we, we can't stop just right there. We need to let it start there and then crawl out in a nucleus from there. And so um, we don't want to be overly focused on just one or two streets, but we do want to make sure that the basis and the foundation that we've laid down there uh, stays healthy and vibrant. Because if you, if you grow too fast or you get away from where you've started before you really get strong, in that core and in those properties and those developments, then I think you weaken that foundation and ultimately it'll have a negative impact on everything else around it. So uh, we need to continue to push downtown, but that doesn't mean that um, that's any one specific uh, part or any one specific interest. That's for the good of all of us. Thank you, Mr. Stanley and Mr. Tillery, thanks for your patience. The same question to you. All right, well, I think downtown is you know, I, I think it has made light years improvement. When I first moved here in 2009, when I was on active duty, there was nothing in downtown. You know, you had the Maxer building, you had some 
fast food places up on the north side of part of downtown. But in the heart of downtown, there wasn't anything. So over the last 10 years, with the embassy suites coming in and the sod poodles and all, you know, Polk Street Eats and Crush Wine Bar, which is one of my wife's favorites, there's a lot that's going on down there and it's great. And I can't, I'm so happy that we're coming out of COVID and back into a warm climate. I'd love, love to see some more open air concerts and things going on that bring the community together. And we've got all that empty retail space. Now that COVID's, you know, hopefully we're coming out of that. We don't have to revert back. I'm really praying that we don't because there's no blueprint for what we just went through. I'd love to see uh, the city incentivize small businesses to move in, you know, to some of those retail outlets. Because I personally think that the days of big department stores are gone. And we've got some great, great entrepreneurs in this town who have boutique shops that would be great downtown. But it's like my two, uh, my two counterparts said, you know, about starting in one place and growing. It's like throwing a rock in a pond. Downtown is where the rock hit. And now we just need to keep going outward. And I want to revitalize Sixth Street and other areas of town, but downtown took a hit with COVID. And now that we're coming out of it, we really want to see us, you know, some things going on down there and then take that same energy and passion to the other parts of the city. I can keep talking if you want. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that response. <laughs> Uh, for the sake of time, we're going to go ahead and continue. Uh, Mr. Chuck Williams from KGNC. Floor is yours. We are not hearing your audio, Mr. Williams. I do show you as unmuted, but we don't seem to be getting an audio feed. Okay, we'll go ahead and come back to Mr. Williams. Uh, we'll go ahead and keep things rolling with our place two candidates, uh, Mr. Jason Fogelsong, Mr. Joe West, and Ms. Frida Powell. Uh, the first question is, is for Mr. Jason Fogelson. Are you in favor of single member districts? Why or why not? I am in favor of single member districts. And the reason for that is that it seems to me that all of our, and I can't speak for all four or all three of our incumbents, but it seems to me that the majority of our representation comes from the Southwest side of town and that the other, other neighborhoods, whether it's the Heights or San Jacinto or the Barrio or all the way over in Eastridge are not being represented by someone from their neighborhood. And I think it would be best if, if those people had a, a familiar face who works and lives in their neighborhood to be their voice on the council. Okay, and how can we accomplish that? I'd probably take a charter amendment. And then you'd have to look at the other question, since we have four precincts in Potter County, we, we'd have to make sure that Randall County, like I'm, the way I'm visualizing this, because I live in Potter, I know there's four precincts and then there's one in Randall. We need to make sure that both sides of both, both sides of each county have equal representation and that it's fair. So we may need to find a way to, to add seats, but I do not like the idea of at-large seats. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Joe West, same question to you. Are you in favor of single member districts? Why or why not? Uh, I am in favor of single member districts. Uh, Amarillo has got a very diverse population and I feel like that should be reflected uh, in our governmental representation. Uh, our current system, our at-large system does have value, but over the years we've seen how inequitable representation has affected neighborhoods that typically don't have representatives. Uh, specifically advocating for the issues and the residents living in those neighborhoods. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Frida Powell, same question to you. Are you in favor of single member districts? Why or why not? Yes, uh, good, good morning, David, and good thank morning. you for having us. Um, being, uh, being elected at law, um, I'm, it's certainly an honor and a privilege for me to serve the citizens of Amarillo, and that is the entire citizens of Amarillo. And of course, me being a minority, I of all people realize the importance of every voice being heard on the council. So that has certainly been my focus uh, throughout my term and serving. Uh, there, are, there are pros and cons for single member districts. And yes, I would be open to uh, you know, hearing those and, and talking about those at the council level. 
uh, when you do have a, a person that represents you and say that he or she is not really doing their job, then you and that person if you do not see eye to eye, you don't have somewhere else to really go. And being elected at law, I can tell you that I've had citizens from all over the city who have contacted me about different issues, different problems, and I have worked hard to take care of it. And so I, I know that the, that the majority of the people in Amarillo know that they can count on me. So I would certainly be open to uh, listening to the pros and cons for single member districts, but more than anything, we have to focus on the data to see if the data, uh, you know, suggests that we need to move in that direction. Of course, that's going to be based on population. It's going to be based on the census. Thank you, Mrs. Powell. Uh, Mr. Williams, yes. the floor is all yours. Take it away. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, let's. I want to get. Let's just get down to the money. And I guess I'm going to ask this from the to one of any of the uh, mayoral candidates. Do you think that you can handle the city's budget as it stands right now? And I guess I can start off with. Uh, oh, how about Paul Karras? I believe you're still muted, Mr. Harris. I can't hear Mr. Harris. Okay, I'm unmuted, but I'm um, clear. okay, uh, I'm still going to have a problem. I have a terrible sore throat, so. Uh, but I've heard that the uh, city budget is uh, about a thousand pages. Uh, and I'm willing to go through that and, and look carefully for what departments can be cut and uh, what needs to be added and so on in order to handle the, uh, the budget. Okay, uh, is Mr. Hunt in? I don't what so. I well, okay, well, I'll tell you what, I'll open this up just about to anybody. And uh, Mr. Gunny Brown, Mr. Brown, let me ask you this. Do you think at this point uh, with, well, as far as I see, everybody's been talking, has been talking about transparency, transparency, transparency. Uh, just what does that transparency mean to you? And do you think that the city of Amarillo is handling its business in the issue and in the vein of transparency all the way around for Mr. Brown. Thank you, Chuck. Well, the, the question on transparency, and I have said this before, and I believe the word transparency, there's three political words I can't not stand. Transparency, change, and you know, I'm, I'm there for the people, okay? Those are the three political words I can't stand because one thing I believe that those are nothing but catchphrase because when you look at those three words usually when they're coming from people they're not especially when you talk about for the people they only for the people if they get elected they're not doing work for the people as we talk right now so get back on track to your question about the transparency you know like uh, Mr. Carl just spoke about, he said the budget is a thousand pages long. I don't know if that's true or not, but I have tried to find the budget on our webpage, on the Amarillo City webpage, couldn't find it. Mr. Tillery was able to go down to City Hall and get the actual budget. budget. They put in a nice little folder and everything for him. Uh, if I remember correctly, they misspelled October, but that's no biggie. Uh, we all have typos. So to answer your question about transparency, anybody with general computer skills should be able to go to a computer and hit budget and they see the budget right there. So I, I don't I don't think it's I don't think it's very 
that easy to find. And I have somebody chiming in says, I have read it and it's easy to find. Well, congratulations, I didn't find it. So I'm just saying that right now. Um, and transparency is in the eyes of the beholder. I mean, I'm, I'm married. I come home and there's a bunch of sh shopping bags in there and everything. And I found them in the bedroom and I'm like, hey, wife, what's going on here? Oh, I just took a little shopping trip. All right. She does the bills. She knows how much we can we can afford. She has her money. I have my money. But transparency, once again, is in the eyes of the beholder. And us as elected officials have to be keeping our citizens informed. It's not our money. It's not the five members of the city council money. It is all 2,000, 200,000 people of Amarillo money. And we need to let them know how we do it. And we, one, one size do not fit all. Different means are gonna to have to be used to show the budget to different types of people. Thank you, because I'm gonna be talking for like 10 minutes if you don't stop me. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, Mr. Williams, if you'll go ahead and ask your next question, please. Okay, I'd like to direct that, that same question to Mr. Sherlin as far as the transparency issue. If there is a lack of transparency in uh, Amarillo between government members or government leaders and the public, particularly where would that be? Where would that be? I don't feel like we are being uh, told the whole truth about every project that's brought forth. We are being told the parts that they want us to hear. Uh, they are very tongue in cheek on a lot of their issues. You can call down, I've called down, I've sent emails to the city commission or city council, and I don't even get a response to my emails. And some of them are very important issues that I would like to have answered. Uh, I did send one to every can, uh, councilman, and the only one that answered was the city manager. I asked the council money what their uh what they believed and what they thought and never got a response i felt like that's very irresponsible that is not being transparent when a commissioner or a councilman does not have time to respond to the citizens in which they uh wanted to serve that is a criminal act in my opinion they should always be transparent if I call them, they should answer their phone. I've been answering more phone calls here lately from citizens I'm not even elected. They want to know what I think because they have tried to call downtown. They get a runaround. They don't get answers. We've got to be transparent, whether it's pretty or it's ugly. We have got to be transparent and tell the truth, not part truth, just like Amarillo Matters. They always tell the truth. It's just not the whole truth. I'll leave it right there. I could go on for a long time. Thank you, Mr. Sherlin. All right, Mr. Williams, one more question, please. Yes. Okay. Um, for place four, for place four, uh, Miss Sharon Delgado, uh, the same question as far as the transparency would go. How do you feel about it now? What's your opinion? Sorry, let me unmute myself. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I think the transparency is actually really what made me want to run. Um, you know, I'm one of those people that if you're sitting at home and complaining or you hear your neighbors complaining, then I think it's your job to step up and to take action. So. I'm not a politician, but I do love Amarillo enough to throw my hat in there. Um, the biggest thing that I've heard is that there's a disconnect in our community and our representation, that the voices aren't being heard or it's considered a collective group that's disconnected from its citizens. So I think that the communication, I think there's efforts made on community meeting, but that doesn't mean that everybody's showing up. Well, I think it's the representation's job to go out to the communities to get that. We're made up of a community that's very diverse, 30 plus languages, residents that are from all over the world that have been prosecuted by their own governments. So I'm sure there's a fear of speaking out, 
But that's our job as leaders to go out and find different ways, keep trying to get out to town halls and get that communication. And like Tom said, I think if we're talking about an issue, I think we go to the public first and get tons of input before we move forward. Thank you. Um, now I will turn it over to uh, Penny Commit from KFDA. Please ask your questions to our place two candidates. The floor is now yours. Thank you. Well, much of the political unrest this summer in the wake of the killing of George Floyd and the many events that followed had a pretty substantial impact on our viewer in whatever way that impact may be. I would like to ask each of the place two candidates what you would do if you are elected or if you are reelected to bring the Amarillo community together. As Ms. Delgado just mentioned, we are a very diverse community, many different languages, many different backgrounds. How do you plan to unite all of those different backgrounds? I'll start with incumbent Powell. Um, thank, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Good morning to you as well. Uh, I'm going to continue to do what I have been doing for the last 30 years, that is be visible in every area of our community throughout the city of Amarillo. And the only way I know to unite and bring people together is, is, is to be out in the public and talking to people and trying to understand their issues and their problems and helping them to solve those. And so on any given day, you know, I, I may be in the, the uh, Hispanic community, uh, the, the uh, you know, the African-American community, uh, just any community throughout Amarillo, just trying to, just trying to help individuals. And it's very hard to unite people, but uh, it's sad to say, I do think that the death of George Floyd has really uh, brought our community together. And I've seen it in the different events that have happened not only in the American community, but like in the um, Somalia community, uh, also the Karen community. And so I have attended events again throughout our city of Amarillo. And that has always been my platform is to unite our city so that we are working together. Thank you so much. Um, I'll toss it over to Mr. West. Uh, well, I'll start off by saying, uh, I'll admit I'm not, uh, I've not done a lot as far as, uh, volunteering for organizations around town. Uh, but in my spare time when I'm not working or, uh, when I'm not, uh, doing something else, uh, if you ask anybody that knows me, I'm always an advocate for those that are in need, uh, folks that, uh, either don't have the means to, uh, you know, hire somebody to do something minor around the house, uh, repair, minor repairs to cars, things like that. Uh, I do see a lot of, uh, I, I, I see a lot of injustices that are really being highlighted, uh, especially over the last summer, then things are kind of uh, being brought up, and I think we need to facilitate a conversation and realize that we as a community are only as uh, good as the folks that, uh, or as the people that we, uh, sorry, uh, we're only as good as the, as the least of us. So we need to be able to elevate the people that are experiencing injustices, bring them to the forefront, and try to address those injustices in a meaningful way. Thank you, Mr. West. And lastly, Mr. Folson, please. There's, there's a whole lot of things to talk about between last summer and today. And I don't really have a great answer for that. But I think that if, if you want to address people seeing each other as others, one of the best ways to do it is to get people to come together and actually meet each other and hear each other. And I think one of the biggest problems in American society today is that we, we have half the country on one side and the other pointing the finger at the other one and not actually sitting down and listening to each other. So I'd like to see some types of events and town hall meetings that would invite people from the community to come and talk to the government, talk to each other. They should be held in parks and other places in various neighborhoods so everybody can be exposed to it and have a chance. 
And then looking at the chat box, uh, what Titus said, there was a meeting in North Heights earlier this week or last week. I didn't hear about it, but I'm a teacher. I'm at work all day. So maybe if I'm elected, one of the things I could do would be to focus on getting that information out to the public to help make sure it's known about because I didn't hear about it. And I'm just one person and maybe I just missed it. Thanks, everyone. Okay, moving right along to our place three candidates, Mr. Tom Sherlin and Mr. Eddie Sauer. The first question for Mr. Uh, Sherlin, what do you plan on doing to address the abandoned buildings throughout Amarillo and especially in North Heights where one third of structures are abandoned? I think first of all, we need to go in and look at the buildings and see their viability to the uh, community to the neighborhood and if they can be revitalized or, or something similar to that I would say let's get in revitalize them and maybe we can start some small uh, neighborhood businesses out of those structures there's a lot of things that can be done there's a lot of people who are unemployed right now a lot of people wow. looking for uh, ways to make a living what if we took one of those buildings and brought the people together that wanted to start a new building and they repainted, they fixed it up and all of this. And at the end of the day, we let them use it for X amount of time. It's just like these big businesses we bring into Amarillo. I mean, it's like Amazon. We give them tax breaks and this kind of thing. We could do the same thing in the communities, in the neighborhoods or self starting new businesses for these people. It's a, uh, there's no reason, I, I, it distresses me as I drive through Amarillo at this day and time and seeing all the empty businesses and the weeds growing up and so on and so forth. It makes Amarillo look, a lot of the area abandoned. I mean, you look at the corner of Sauncy and I-40 where the Mexican food restaurant's been out of business for now a couple of years. And last summer, the weeds got up to four feet hauled. We should be able to find businesses to occupy empty spaces. There's no reason, I don't think we're going out into the community and talking to the people in the neighborhoods to see what we can do to better serve that neighborhood. It takes uh, putting your feet on the ground, walking from door to door. I have learned more going in and sitting down and having coffee in a neighborhood and found out the needs. These are the things we can't expect the people to go downtown we downtown needs to go out to the people. They were elected to serve. Let's serve the people and see what we can do to further and make the people of Amarillo better. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Eddie Sauer, same question to you. What do you plan on doing to address or what is currently being done uh, to address the abandoned buildings throughout Amarillo and especially in North Heights where one third of structures are abandoned? Uh, thank you, David. I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak. Um, the first thing that really you kind of have to, you have to consider when you do this is most of these abandoned buildings are actually private property. And whenever they are private property, uh, getting that taken care of is not a simplistic kind of uh, situation that goes on. Uh, I live in Bivens. Uh, there was a house that has been abandoned for a, for a long number of years. Uh, and it took a, and the, the structure actually needed to be condemned. And it took years for that to happen because you're talking about private property and you're talking about infringing upon the rights of people who own that private property and getting them to make that movement. Um, honestly, the best thing that we can, that we can do is try and provide uh, economic development in that part of town. So let's talk about the north part of town and the economic development that has been uh, headed for that period. And hopefully what our end result is, is we get people that are interested and in that not only do we get people interested, but we get businesses that are interested in moving over there. Prime example, uh, the, no the North Heights Linen Project that will open in May, that was an abandoned building. That was very, very, very difficult to get the old Amarillo Hotel condemned. The city ended up having to pay for the demolition of that building. And it was the people that owned the land didn't even live in Amarillo. So it was very hard to get this transaction across the finish line. And here we are, that was four years ago. And here we are, May, 
of 2021 and that and now that we've got the North Heights Linden that will open at that point in time, they will start with 40 employees. The hope is that they work up. So whenever you begin to start employing those people, then they've got money to then reinvest in, in that part of town. On top of that, let's talk about um, the uh, uh, Plains uh, Dairy and Affiliated Foods. They took the old tech spray building. Uh, they've spent millions of dollars on that building, getting it ready so that now then they're, they're opening Panhandle Pure. Panhandle Pure is going to now uh, be a new bottling. They did that as a result of COVID. They couldn't get a hold of bottling. So now then, whenever we do these kinds of things, it begins to infuse money. It begins to infuse traffic. So now then let's talk about infusing traffic into the North Heights area so that people say, hey, I want to go here or I want to go here. Um, the Thompson Park pool, that Thompson Park pool, it probably needed to be condemned 20 years ago. And it's been piecemealed along until finally we didn't have a choice. So to do that right, we go back, we talk to the community, predominantly in North Heights, what do you guys need for a replacement? Because you can't just dig another hole in the ground and fill it with water and call that a pool. That's going to be an expensive project. So we get that all situated. And now then it's being built north of uh, the uh, Wonderland Park in Thompson Park, which, by the way, uh, okay, sir, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you go ahead and uh, wrap up, please? Okay. So all of those things, basically, if you would go and look at the economic development, it's occurring. Amazon's in the southeast. We've got the tech vet school. We've got the things that will be occurring with that. Uh, our front page on the paper today is CK that's going in the southeast side of town. We are building, we are slowly addressing all of these issues and you've got to do that by developing things economically. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Williams, the floor is now yours for place three candidates. Take it away. Tom Sherlin, I tell you, uh, let me ask you this if I may. Exactly who have you sat down in North and East Amarillo to bring yourself to, con you know, to your conclusion? What group Are you, or anybody in particular? It was nobody in particular. I walk in, I have coffee, I go around and ask tables, what do you think about city? What can we do better? What can we do to make things happen and address the needs in your community? I have not personally gone in and set up a meeting. I like to go out. It's sort of like what they do on Fox News in the morning. Go to a restaurant, sit down, and you can find more information sitting in a restaurant, taking the time to listen to people. I would recommend that to all the office holders we have today and all those that are wanting to be office holders. You can find out more by sitting down and, and taking the time to listen to people. I think a lot of time, if you target a specific individual or a specific uh, place, you end up getting their viewpoint. I'd rather get the viewpoint of 10 different people sitting in a restaurant and may sit there for two hours just talking in and out with people. Well, uh, if, if I may, let me ask you this. Can you tell me what restaurant have you been going to to pull your information? I went to Delvin's for one on use and visited there. Then I went over on the east side to a couple of different Mexican food places and sat there as well. Okay, you Mr. Need, Sa you, go ahead. Uh, uh, to Mr. Sauer, if I may, let me ask you the same questions. Uh, what do you feel, well, how have you traveled around? Where are you gleaning your information from the community? Well, obviously, I've attended hundreds of meetings in the past four years. And so um, you always get that opportunity to talk to different people. Um, the fact of you, whenever you have those kind of meetings and they know that you're on city council, then they're going to talk to you about what their concerns are. And so I've talked to uh, hundreds of different people all across cities all across this town about many, many different things. And then I, I, I'm not gonna discount my, my own dental practice. My own dental practice, I have people from all over the city, honestly, from all over the panhandle in the region. Um, and they know me by, by my name, 
and they come in and they sit down and we have candid conversations. And so the interesting thing is, is not only do I have people that are coming, I have them coming from all four quadrants of town. I have them coming from Canyon. I have them coming from all these different places that work in Amarillo. And so um, I get a very good opportunity to see what are their hot buttons? What are the things that are important to them? Uh, what do they want to see done in Amarillo? And, and the interesting thing is whenever you've got more people than just the city of Amarillo and regionally, you find out that we are the hub. We are the regional hub. They are coming to Amarillo and they've all got opinions because they're all looking to get certain things out of town, whether they're coming to our regional medical center uh, for those kind of things or whether they're coming to the car dealerships or they're coming to do shopping. Uh, so I get that opportunity really to talk to a, a large number of people. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, Mrs. Penny Commit from KFDA, the floor is now yours to ask questions to our place three candidates. Thank you. So many of our community members are very concerned about our arts organizations and how arts organizations have been hurt during this pandemic, not being able to have events or fundraisers. And we are so blessed in Amarillo to have so many wonderful art nonprofits. I would like to start with the incumbent and in asking how you feel about modifications um, to the city's current funding stream to support local arts and culture. Uh, you know what, <clears throat> I think Penny, as we go forward, the first thing that we gotta do is we have to make for sure that that that's gonna be something that we will be able to fund. Um, I, I'm very interested in looking at that. Um, I'm on the Beautification and Arts Board. Uh, we have talked about uh, maybe that being a portion of, uh, like other cities have got a, port where you put a portion of new building or new structure funds into arts and beautification. Um, that's being bannered around, it's being talked about, there's a lot of pros, there's a lot of cons concerning that kind of, of a situation, but it's worth talking about. Um, and one thing you can say for sure is being on that board for the past four years, we have an incredible arts community here. We have some incredible individuals that can do some beautiful work. And so um, we need to give them the opportunity to let Amarillo be their canvas. Uh, we've been fortunate enough uh, that whenever we started the mural grant program, the one that started at the Civic at the uh, airport, the next thing you know, we've got over two dozen of those. The Hoodoo Mural Festival has come out of that. So these are the things that we can kind of create. Also, we will do the initial beautification project on the rails to trails this year at uh, Western and Plains. That's going to be all of these things. We need to embrace them. We need to figure out how we work with them because they're going to be what helps us put the best picture forward of what Amarillo is going to look like. Thank you so much. And I'll ask the same question regarding arts and culture to your opponent. Sorry about that. It took me a while to get unmuted. Uh, I think we need to really work to bring out the arts and culture in our community. I think we need to do a lot more where people are aware of what we got, what we have to offer. And the city needs to help in all of these types of areas, getting people together to create cultures. I know, for instance, in San Antonio, the city area sponsors a cultural weekend where the different communities come together. They have food, they have bands, they have all this stuff. I think this would be good so that we learn each other. We learn the cultures of the different communities, of their different ethnic groups. and. By doing so, we become more one together with each other. I would like to see us do more of this kind of stuff with the arts. I know down at Emerald College, they have the Art Center that is not very well visited, but it is a great, great opportunity for people to go and see the arts. And then down on 6th Street, I don't think we really tell people what we have to offer. And if we do, it's not getting out to the people so that they know what to do and how to see it. I would recommend that we put out a weekly or, or monthly type of deal that says, 
here's what we got. Here's where it is. And please come. I'll leave it there. Thank, Thank you, you both. Okay, moving right along to our place for candidates, uh, Ms. Allie Ramos, Mr. Howard Smith, Smith, excuse me, uh, Mrs. Sharon Delgado, and Mr. Richard Herman. Our first question is for uh, Mrs. Allie Ramos. Um, in which ways have you shown or will show your support for the three neighborhood plans? Yeah, I am a really big advocate of networking. So I want to make sure that, um, you know, the, the three different neighborhood uh, committees, I, I know that I am friends with a lot of people who are on these committees. So I, I just, I want to start a dialogue. I want to um, basically just make sure that they know that I am uh, available to speak and so yeah just to, to speak and talk and connect. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Sharon Delgado. Mrs. Delgado. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. I had to unmute too like Tom. Uh, I think the advisory communities are a great way to, to hear people. I think we have to show up and listen to them uh, and address their concerns. Uh, I have, when the question asked earlier, like who have you talked to? I think the thing is, I don't think any of us on this panelist have the answers, but I think our community is wise enough to have it. So like I went to Patrick Miller, the NAAC president. I talked to Mary Bailey, uh, president of, um, Los Barrios, I have talked to police officers. Um, that's our job to go out and ask questions and uh, to hear from the community. So really my answer is to go and listen because I don't have the answers, but I think our citizens are wise enough for me to go and ask questions and listen. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Howard Smith. Thank you very much. Uh, here's what I've done to keep up. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Uh, I've been to quite a few of the meetings. We've, the North Heights was the first neighborhood uh, plan that was started. And I've been to several of their meetings and listened to what they have. The Barrio is another one. I've been to several of those meetings. Uh, San Jacinto, I've been to several of those meetings. So uh, one of my platforms is to listen to people. We got to listen to people. So I go to a lot of, a lot of meetings. East Ridge is the fourth neighborhood. It just started in January. It's just barely started. Of course, all of these neighborhood associations uh, meetings have been penalized because of COVID. It's been hard to, to get things going, but they're all going. There's a certain amount of uh, money that is designated for each of these neighborhoods and I support that. Uh, what we want to happen in these neighborhood meetings is we want to, the neighborhoods to come up with what they think needs to be done. It's not the city council saying do this or do that. We want to listen to what they want done and then see if that can be worked into the budget. And so that's that's what I'm doing to help the neighborhood associations. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Richard Herman, same question to you. Okay, well, first off, I think it's a great program. I don't know where we are on starting the fourth one. I remember we were supposed to start one in January, so there would actually be more than three. Um, one on the east side, of course, I've attended the meetings over there at Wesley, and I love the way that they they break everything down and they analyze it and they get the people involved. That was the thing that really, really impressed me. Uh, a lot of people don't know they can go online and there's actually a neighborhood association toolkits. They don't understand all the things out there. The thing I've done the most personally is I'm involved with picking up trash. And I know nobody wants to talk about trash, but that's a big thing I've actually done. I went over and you know picked up the long streets, the trash, uh, we removed a bunch of uh, inappropriate 
paintings from underneath the bridge there on Buchanan Street. So I've, I've kind of been involved, maybe not as much as I should, you know, because in my opinion, we should, you know, actually be involved in our own area <laughs> instead of going into other people's areas. Clean up your own backyard first is what I like to say before you go trying to clean somebody else's backyard. Now, if I was elected as a city council member, of course, now it would be up to me to get more people involved. And, you know, my solution to everything is barbecue. Let's get some barbecue. Let's feed people. Let's break bread. And let's all get together. And I think when you do things like that, you may be able to get more. Um, the San Jacinto, I think that's over there in your area, Jason. Uh, I, I attended that one over there and there, there was very little uh, participation amongst the community. And the greatest way I think that we could get more participation is to break bread, you know, do something. If I mean, chili's cheap. Let's, let's get the community. We got churches in these areas. And matter of fact, there's a, I can't remember his name. There's one pastor over there on the uh, east side and uh, gets really, really involved. And then, uh, well, Pastor and Mary Pride, I think they're involved in it, Frida. I don't remember for sure. So, you know, we got people in every area that can organize these things. I call them uh, grapevine leaders in the community. And we need to do a better job of identifying them and getting people out and bringing people together. That's my thing. I think it's a great deal though. And like I said, I would like to hear from one of our current council members because I haven't really tracked it like I should. Maybe Howard or uh, Ginger or somebody can tell me, have we kicked off that fourth one yet? You know, that would we be- can, We can address that uh, yeah. later on. If, I appreciate if you, there, Dave. There is time. Yes, yes, sir, absolutely. Uh, Mr. You, Williams from KGNC. Uh, questions for place four candidates. Take it away. Okay. Uh, I guess I'll kick off with Ms. Delgado again and ask you this. Do you see the city actually uh, working wholeheartedly towards ADA uh, amenities in town? I mean, I know in the city, you know, a lot of the buildings downtown, they're all ADA am amenable. But uh, can't there be some other ADA issues that can be put into place overall and where? I start talking before I unmute, so I'm sorry. I Absolutely. I am an educator of 25 years working with children that have special needs. And what I can tell you is that there is a gap in services. Those parents will tell you that they need resources, <laughs> Uh, even working with uh, adults with autism, I think that we have to, even in my private practice working with adults with autism, I think there has to be training for our law enforcement, how we deal with autism, or people that might have mental health issues. Um, I think that that is one of those uh, gaps in our services. When I met with uh, Jason Middlesberg with the uh, Amarillo uh, City our Community Development, him and I had a lot of conversation, even, even about um, homes or living uh, places for uh, adults with special needs, that there would be some kind of support and even looking at the potential for that. So I think when we talk about ADA, it's just not being accessible, which there's lots of difficulties. And go back to whoever asked the question about like the website when Gunny, you were saying how hard it is to find. I know that the Emerald Globe News when I taught special ed children used to be written on a seventh grade level. If our city website is difficult for our average, uh, I think our average education, I can't remember exactly. Uh, eight point has 8% 8 of our population has less than a ninth grade education, then our city website needs to be written on that, that for people who have disabilities. And that, that if they can't read it, that we have access that they can call and actually get their questions answered. So I'm a big advocate for uh, making sure our community is accessible for everyone. Mr. Herman, the same question to you, sir. I think as far as the city, we're doing a pretty decent job. I think that this question really isn't in the lane of the city council. I, I believe this is more the, the areas that we need to improve 
are actually the responsibility of the college boards, the uh, AISD boards and stuff like that. So I, I don't think that question is appropriate for the city council. Not that it ain't a good question. I just think that we're addressing it to the wrong people. Uh, that's my opinion. Ms. Ramos? Yeah, since I am a disabled person, this question is incredibly relevant to city council because it, we, you know, if I were elected, this is, we want to make sure as city council members that we are equitable in our decision making. And that means we need to hear the disabled community speak. We, you know, a lot of times uh, disabled people are shoved in the back of uh, decision making processes. We're not involved in policies that are created for us. So it's able bodied and neurotypical individuals are making the decisions, which is not how it should be. So I feel like we would need to, um, you know, talk to people and make sure that our streets are adequate, our buildings are accessible, our restrooms are accessible. Um, I know in City Hall, there's like one tiny accessible restroom. So I think that there are plans on, you know, uh, getting a new building. I'm not really sure where that is, but I, you know, I, I think that disabled people need to be in the forefront and uh, discuss all of the ADA accommodations that need to be, uh, uh, you know, put into place. And Mr. Smith, could you please go with that question, please? <laughs> I'm sorry, so we can't hear you. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'll be glad to answer that question. I have an office uh, that I purchased several years ago and uh, it needed in the city required a lot of things. Had to widen doorways to make the restroom more accessible. Had to put a ramp in front of the building. And I'm not complaining about any of that because I have, I've been in real estate 41 years and people come to my office and they need a way to get into my office, use the restroom. And so uh, being in real estate, I'm all, kind of all over town. And I remember seeing a lot of areas where the ramps at the corners were being made handicap accessible. So it, it's being addressed, and I, I think it's, uh, I could be wrong about this, I think it's a federal rule that that be done. And so uh, and the city may be having to pay for it, but uh, the city required me to do things in my own office. So I think it's very important. We need to make it possible for everybody to get where they need to be uh, if they're handicapped. Thank you, sir. All right, moving right along, um, our mayoral candidates, uh, Mr. Michael Hunt, uh, Mrs. Claudette Smith, Mr. Carl Karras, and uh, Ms. Ginger, Ms. Ginger Nelson. Uh, the first question is for uh, Mrs. Claudette Smith. Uh, Mr. Hunt um, is not able to join us um, today, so we're gonna go ahead and, and proceed uh, without him. Uh, the question to you are, or is, excuse me, define your standard of ethics when serving in a public office. Uh, David, I don't think Ms. Smith is on. Okay, we'll go ahead and um, turn that question to Mr. Carl Karras. Define your standard of ethics when serving in a public office. Well, um, I think uh, trust is the most important thing and uh, honesty and uh, uh, 
persistence in serving people. And uh, I think that, that wraps it up pretty much for me. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Nelson, define your standard of ethics when serving in a public office. Happiness, David, and all the work that you guys have put to making this forum happen today. Um, my basic standard of ethics is tied to my faith, and that is Christianity. I, I don't have a different standard of ethics that I use to do public service or to be an attorney or to be a mom. Um, I use that same standard and, and try every day to hit the mark, um, but it's, it's obviously an impossible mark to hit to be um, what Jesus is teaching us to be. And I think in addition to that, the four years that I've spent as mayor have taught me that two very important things to strive for in interacting with people, um, especially people that don't share my viewpoint um, or have a different perspective than I have, is just to treat them always, always with dignity and respect. Thank you, Mayor Nelson. Uh, Penny Commit from KFDA, the floor is now yours. Thank you. My question is, many of our community members rely on our means of public transportation. It helps overall accessibility, equity in our city, um, helps decrease food deserts, job insecurity. How do you feel our current public transportation stands and what can we do to um, you know, improve mobility for people that rely on public transportation? I'll start with uh, Mayor Ginger Nelson. Thank you for that question. Um, public transportation is so important. People who um, need to get to work, who have, maybe they're disabled and it is their only way to get to medical appointments. Um, we have been behind in the services that we provide and the council before us began to make some changes by investing in um, a, a transit study. And we have taken the results of those transit study, that transit study and made some drastic changes um, to the bus routes in our city. One new change that's coming in the next 18 months, we are building a new transit station in the center of town. So the one that's downtown is just, it's old and it doesn't meet the needs. And, and I would address the ADA question from city facilities point of view is just saying a lot of our facilities are old. And if they're 50 years old, they don't meet the ADA standards um, in a way that a disabled citizen would have the same access as um, an able-bodied citizen. So one of the things we have to do is begin to address those um, aging facilities that we have and in, in transit that penny that's one of the things that we're doing we'll be building that new bus station the good news for taxpayers is we found a way to do it with transportation dollars from the federal government and not putting a burden on property tax owners so uh, that's that's always the kicker everybody would like to have new facilities but the question is how to pay for it um, so we just have to balance that and always be looking for opportunities for those federal grants and federal dollars to help us do large infrastructure. And, and I'm excited about seeing that new bus station built. It, it will be a multimodal station, actually Greyhound bus. Um, it will connect to the rails to trails bike trail. So some it is an infrastructure problem, but also it's just a matter of what do we as a community want to prioritize? Do we want to have a city that um, has better bike lanes and is more walkable? Right now we are a very car dependent society. In here in our city, we're very car dependent. And so if you're a citizen without a car, that puts you on the fringe of being able to access services and the things that are provided in our city. So again, it's a matter of listening and talking to people who fit in that category and hearing what their needs are. How can we systemically make the changes they need to have the same access? Thank you, Mary Nelson. And I'll ask the same question to her opponent, Mr. Carl Cross. Karis. Uh, well, I, I thought you. that was a <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good answer by Mayor Nelson. Um, I don't think uh, we have presently uh, service on the on the weekends uh, or as much as we need uh, for bus service. Um, there's nothing running down Bell, and uh, well, the whole traffic pattern of of Bell Street. 
uh, north to south is, is uh, an issue, not just for buses, but a uh, pile up of traffic there. Um, as far as uh, the buses themselves, I think we should start looking at electric. Um, and uh, uh, as, as for the uh, new downtown facility, um, the entire, well, a lot of the downtown, blocks and blocks of it, is not uh, uh, ADA. So um, we, that has to be looked at um, as far as a, an upgrade. Um, you've got two different uh, curb heights and uh, it would require countless ramps. And as uh, Howard was saying, uh, you wanna put downtown, often you have to uh, put a lot of, uh, uh, money into uh, solving that that issue, the ramping and so on. Um, I think the new downtown facility is great. And uh, as Mayor Nelson was saying, uh, a lot of our, our facilities in town are 50 years and older, and uh, in, including City Hall, and need to uh, that needs to be addressed. So I'll wrap it up with that. Thank you, sir. Uh, turning things over to um, Mr. Chuck Williams from KGNC for uh, our mayoral candidates. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, the big thing, it seems, in many cases is nobody ever gets everything they want. You have to compromise one way or the other. How would you handle the issue of compromise to make sure that if it's that everything would be more equitable along the line. And I'll start out with Mr. Hunt on that one. I don't think he's here. Sir, Mr. Hunt is not here. Um, okay. Only Mayor uh, and Carl. Let, let me go with Mr. Karras then. Yes, sir. Uh, could you, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Or uh, would, uh, just bits of it? How would you handle the issue of compromise across the board to get things accomplished in Amarillo? Naturally, we can't have everything our way, so we have to compromise. How could you, how could you aid in that issue of compromising and getting something done? I think that's an excellent question. And, uh, it brings up uh, something that I think is missing here is that you need to, you can't just talk to people in, in neighborhoods. And I, I mean, it, it's great that you, you do that and you find out the citizens' needs, but you also need to bring in some expertise and, uh, to bear on these, on these issues. Uh, urban designers, urban uh, planners have to be brought in as consultants or, or uh, hired. Uh, and uh, as for architecture, we could have competitions and, uh, and invite architects and, and, and planners. We need, a, we need a comprehensive city plan and we, we don't have that. So we don't, there is not a blueprint for how the city is, is gonna grow. And, and, and that, that is, it's missing like a missing tooth. Uh, we're, get, we're getting a, a lot of development to the Southwest. It's stretching halfway to Canyon. And uh, so a, a lot of uh, what's going on in, Northeast and, and the east side uh, is ignored or, or it's, it's not a, a fitting into a, any plan of growth or uh, you know whether that's intentional or not, um, I'm not sure, but um, it, it can be, if, if there's no representation of those uh, communities, uh, it, you know, and, and I see single me member districts as 
as something that would help with representation of areas in the city uh, that are not, uh, their growth is not planned. So um, that's a huge question. And, and the expertise from professionals is what's missing here. And the same question to Mayor Ginger Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Williams. <clears throat> you know, if you've been married for very long, you know that to make it work, you have to compromise. And I think living together in the city is a lot like being married to each other. We have different ideas and we have different wants. In our household, um, I prefer a vacation in warm weather. My husband prefers a vacation in cool weather. So if our budget dollars allow only one vacation, we're gonna have to compromise somehow. And that, well, that just looks like we have a conversation about it, we prioritize, and we're willing, both of us, to give a little, and sometimes a lot, and sometimes people have to give um, more than 50. So I think when we, and for the last four years, this city council has approached many issues that required compromise. Uh, we talked about buildings, and yet we want low taxes, and we have kept taxes low. Um, when you compare us to the 10 cities larger and the 10 cities smaller than us, Amarillo has the second lowest tax rate. So it always involves compromise. Um, I think we've struck compromise when it comes to social issues in our community. We appointed the task force for greatness because we did not want to hold our breath and, and hope those issues went away. We turned into them and we wanted to talk about them as a community that means having conversation. It means having as many different perspectives at that table as good. And then we will, we will have compromise um, out of that. When we're listening to each other and we have the opportunity for all the different voices in Amarillo to be heard. I think it's really important for us to have facts. Um, and I know it, it's hard. It's, it's hard as a candidate. I've been that candidate who wasn't in office. It's hard to have all the facts. Um, I, I spend 40 hours a week doing the mayor's job um, every week, and so it's easier for me to have the facts, but I, I did want to point out that Mr. Fogelson stated earlier that we all live in southwest Amarillo, and that's, that's a fact that's not true. Four of the current council members live north of I-40. I live south of I-40 by two blocks. I live uh, near Amarillo College, so actually all five of the council members on the current council don't live in southwest Amarillo. So I think it's a challenge to have the facts. And if you are coming together to sit at the table, you have to have the facts, you have to have conversation, and you have to be willing to listen to all the perspectives. It's not, I'm, I always tell people I'm very impatient. I call myself the impatient mayor. I want it done yesterday, I want it done now, and I want it to be in a hurry. And the process of compromise is not something that can be hurried because it does need to involve all the different perspectives. And just like the NAACP has allotted three hours for us today to have this conversation, it's a time investment. So um, I am in support of compromise in, from a leadership point of view. Um, and I think it is important that that is part of our leadership style. And I think the current council has shown that we do focus on compromise and listening to all perspectives. Thank you, Mayor Nelson. Okay, moving right along to, well, actually we're gonna go ahead and uh, field a couple of more questions for our two mayor candidates that are uh, with us here today. Um, the first question, What actions will you take to close the gap in low socioeconomic sectors of the city? Can I go first on this one, David? Go ahead, take it away, Mayor Nelson. Okay, I think one of the most important things we need to do is make sure that every citizen has access to broadband internet. And this is a project that we're working on right now. Um, Councilman Smith is leading it, but I absolutely support it. And the project as we're designing it would provide free um, broadband access to every person who lives in Amarillo and every visitor traveling through Amarillo. 
And what does that, how does that equalize us? Well, basically we are trending toward a more and more digital society. And in the last year, as we saw students go home to do virtual learning and people have to work from their homes, um, we saw that we did not have equal access in our city. And I, just like we would want all citizens to have access to electricity and water, access to the internet is now becoming a basic need in order to success. You, if you cannot turn in your fifth grade math homework, then you're gonna have a hard time getting to sixth grade. And if you can't get to sixth grade, then you can't graduate. And if you can't graduate, then you're not likely to continue your, your education past high school. And so I want that for every student that's in our city, but I want it for our city because every student who can complete their education and go further past high school can become part of our workforce. And that allows the EDC, the Amarillo Economic Development Corporation, to better sell and market Amarillo because our workforce is larger and our workforce is better skilled. And we see the benefit of that just in what they brought in the last um, couple of years while this council has been focusing on economic development, whether it's the Texas Tech Vet School, it's the Amazon Distribution Center, it's SSI Foods, it's Kasike LLC. Every time we bring new jobs into the city because we have a better educated workforce, that brings dollars into our economic bucket that we didn't have before. So the coffee shop and the dry cleaners and the dentist office, they just normally, they just trade the dollars we already have. But when Amazon brings in $36 million into that budget, now they have $36 million more to trade. So all of that economic development, all of that socioeconomic growth that we want to see in closing the gap so that all citizens have a great life in Amarillo, I think is tied to what we're doing in economic development and how we get people internet access. And I think we, we would be leading the state in that internet access project. We would be the only city in the state of Texas providing broadband through um, wireless network like we have designed to do. So I like it that Amarillo is on people's tongues and minds as an innovator. And um, I think that's where we should be. We should be leaders in, our, in the Texas Panhandle community, but our leadership shouldn't be limited to the Texas Thank you, Mayor Nelson. Uh, Mr. Karras, question to you. Same question to you. What actions will you take to close the gap in low socioeconomic sectors of the city? Well, I'd first of all like to uh, start off uh, talking about a six, uh, six single member districts, uh, three um, in, in Potter and three on the south side, uh, divided on the county line. And that's gonna uh, right, right away. I, I mean, you'd have to change the charter and so on, but that's right away going to, to start giving uh, uh, people from lower socioeconomic groups uh, more representation. And um, it will, I, I think it will, uh, spark uh, uh, people from from these areas to come forward and to serve and 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 uh, it will address a huge imbalance that's here in town um, but I, I the the current mayor and council seem to take credit for a lot of these businesses coming in and, and which they had very little to do with it seems to me I, I just want to Get that on the table, um, but I want I want to look at uh, thirty three thousand cases of COVID here, and and talk about you know business is important, but our health is more important, and not every I know not everybody agrees with me on that. Here it's a pro business community, but that's that would be my attitude. And what I what I stand for, yeah, I think our hospitals here are terrific. Uh, my father was a surgeon, so I'm I'm a little bit aware of uh, what's going on here, hospital wise. A great medical community. Um, so I think they handled it well, and they I, I'm certain that they kept the number of deaths down. 
but now you've got 33,000 adults out of a population of, let's say, 150,000 adults. That's a, a COVID uh, rate of over 20% of, of the population of the city. And, and we've got to talk about that as an issue because those are, black people are twice as likely to get COVID. So there's that issue. Hispanic people are three times as likely to get COVID. So let's look at that. Let's look at that 33,000 number and find out what happened to those people. How many were black? How many Hispanic? And uh, help them. Uh, a lot of them are gonna have uh, uh, problems with their lungs for the rest of their lives. How many of those people we go ahead and wrap will not, and will not, how many of those, I'll, I'm wrapping it up. How many of those people will not be able to work anymore? And how many are long haulers? We need to study that. that and, and, and that is an economic issue too. So. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Williams from KGNC. Or is yours to ask our mayor candidates your question? Uh, yeah, first off, I'd kind of like to know where Mr. Karras got his numbers from uh, as far as the uh, uh, percentage of people with COVID, et cetera. And uh, I thought the population of the area was a little bit larger than 150,000. Now, maybe I'm wrong, but could you clarify that for me? Sure. Um, I'm talking about the people who get COVID are adults and the elderly. Right. So if you, so there are approximately 150,000 out of 200,000 people here who are adults and elderly who would be susceptible to getting COVID. So that's, that's a, that's a very, at any rate, um, 33,000 out of 200,000 is 16% of the population. That's very high nationally. And then you've got to look, you've got to look at Texas itself. They've done, they're way behind in vaccinations. Uh, in, in, they're, they're in the between 40 and 50 in uh, the states. So, but what what other figures can I uh, can I clarify? Well, no, that that would be good enough to suit me. Uh, okay. Mayor Nelson, could you address that same issue? Well, I think it's important that voters know um, just because a candidate has a perception of something that facts are very, very important. And so a candidate may state their perception of an issue, and, but unless they have a source they can cite that ties it to the exact data, um, I think as a voter, you need to be cautious about relying on a candidate's perception. For instance, it was mentioned that the city doesn't have a blueprint or a, um, an, you know, an investment plan for how we do infrastructure. Um, it, it does actually. So that candidate has a perception that we don't have one, but the facts are we actually do have a blueprint for how to develop and expand the community and how we invest in waste and sewage and, and water infrastructure in order to support that development. Um, so I, you know, if you're going to talk about COVID and vaccinations, we at the city clinic alone vaccinated over 100,000 people. We have led the nation in the most effective vaccine clinic, clinic. We still lead the state in effectiveness for the number of people in the speed with which we have vaccinated them. Um, when I look back over the last year, there've been a lot of unexpected, difficult decision situations um, where given more time to study it and get the data, I might make a different decision. But I know at the time, we as a council made the best decision we could to protect as many people as we possibly could. And I grieve with every family that has lost a loved one. I have lost 
loved ones um, in our city due to COVID. And I don't take that lightly. Uh, that's a burden that sits hard on my heart. But I just, I want to caution voters that we rely on facts and not just perceptions. And I do recognize it's sometimes hard to tell the difference. Thank you, Mayor Nelson. Okay, moving right along, um, place one candidates and just a general reminder for our candidates to keep your responses um, short and to the point just for uh, the purpose of, of time. Um, so place one, Jason Tillery, did you vote for the renovation of the Civic Center? Why or why not? Yes, I did. I did vote for the renovation of the Civic Center. Our Civic Center was built in 1968 and hasn't been refurbished much since then. It is a great, we had a great opportunity, and I still think we do, even though it got voted down, to renovate the Civic Center. It brings in conventions, it brings in sporting events, it brings in trade shows, gun shows, things of that nature. We are the largest city in our region, not just of the state, but of the country. We have got to update that Civic Center. I know people didn't want the tax increase. I understand that. I've learned more about it since I've been running for city council, different plans to get that done. But it needs to be done because it will attract more business. It will, it will raise our marketability as a city throughout the state and this area of the country. And I think people coming in who spend their weekend tourist dollars, if we have something that attractive that attracts other businesses, some of those people may want to call Amarillo home and turn those weekend dollars into permanent dollars. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Brown, did you vote for the renovation of the Civic Center? Why or why not? <laughs> Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown, can you turn up your volume, please? And I was on a roll there, too. All right. <laughs> no, I did not vote for the Civic Center uh, renovation. I was at the full disclosure. I was actually the treasurer for the PAC that went uh, against it. However, like uh, individuals have, it wasn't against the Civic Center itself. It was against the tax dollars it was against what the people were saying. Right now, like I have said many times, in 1983, I got kicked out of a Joan Jett concert there, there at that Civic Center. And even then I said, we need something better. And we still need something better. However, though, uh, like I have said a hundred times, it's not our money, it's the citizen money. Until the people of Amarillo tell me what they're willing to spend for a civic center, I'm going to have to vote no. I will, I will continue to vote no. And maybe I did not go to the right people, but I think with my diverse background of the people that I hang out with, be it on the north side and with uh, my Harley chapter, I, there's a very diverse population right there. And I don't, most of all those people I talk to, some of them work fast food. Some of them are big company owners. And they was telling me, no, we're not ready for you to raise our taxes. So I took it upon myself to vote, vote no and lead the, the group that went against it. Were there some missteps in that? Very much, very much some missteps. Am I disappointed in some of the ways that we handle some of the, the things that takes place? Yes, I am and I will continue to fight for the people. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Cole Stanley, you're up. Did you vote for the renovation of the Civic Center? Why or why not? Take it away. I think I'm, uh, I'm in the majority of our population where most of us feel the same way. I voted no against it um, at the time for the main reason of timing and then the other reason of the overall size of the project and the inability to take it uh, one bite at a time. So that proposition uh, came up at the worst possible time for our community to um, have to go after something like that. And, and, and I'm a risk taker and I'm a businessman and I see the, the value and definitely wanted to vote yes. Looked at every possible way that I could vote for it. Um, would have been a yes if we could have taken it in phases. Uh, but because of the way it was proposed and, and where they were in the process, along with the timing, 
um, that was not something that was that was on the table. And so with all of the given data, I feel like I made the same decision that most of us made, um, which um, it had more risk than reward at that time. And I don't feel like we've missed that opportunity. I feel like we will have uh, another opportunity to continue to pursue that need. All right, thank you, sir. Um, now I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Mrs. Penny Commit from KFDA with her questions for place one candidates. Take it away. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me. I would like to ask all of the place one candidates how you plan to support our refugee population that we all know is decently large here in Amarillo. And I will start with Mr. Tillery. Well, that is a, that's a tough question. Um, I don't have a blueprint on how to take care of the refugee population. I think where it needs to start is working with people in city government and look at housing issues, food issues, uh, work with the medical community to take care of any medical issues and see what we need to do from a state state perspective on how to deal with that population, you know, homeless or sorry, refugee population. And then once we get them in a position where they have adequate housing, work on getting them job training, helping, helping them with uh, dealing with language barriers. I, I saw a lot of that in the Navy with people coming into the military who didn't speak English as a first, second, or even third language. So you've got to be able to work with that issue. Then once we get them housed, employed, get their medical needs taken care of, find a way to integrate them into the community. We can't just get them set up and put them away, but this is where we come together, work with them and bring them into our community so they know that we care. And they're, they're not just placed here as uh, temporary, but they feel like they're actually part of the community. Thank you. Mr. Brown, okay. same question. You know, uh, on December 18th, when I announced my candidacy, I brought up the East Ridge neighborhood. And I, one thing I brought up was that I hadn't been over there since 2011 when my aunt passed away over there on Columbine Street. So I took a, I took a trip over there. And like my good friend, Jason, we, we had been to some third world countries. That's a bad neighborhood. That, that has to be our worst neighborhood in Amarillo. And when people say they choose to live like that, no, they don't choose to live like that. It's, 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 not, good. it's not just gonna be the city council that's gonna have to take on that. It's gonna to have to be some good hearted people here in Amarillo. It's gonna to have to be some individuals here that are, are, are saying they're Christians and they care about the neighborhoods they're gonna to have to get out there. When lose, tie, draw, I'll find a way to help that neighborhood over there because I grew up with my aunt over there and my uncle. I grew up running those streets. And I'm ashamed I have turned my back on it on my childhood. So it, it's, it's not gonna be just the city council. It's gonna to have to be some, some things. It's gonna to have to be individuals getting involved in big brothers, big sisters. It's gonna to have to be some individuals getting involved in, in multiple things instead of just individuals saying, I'm there for the people. We're gonna to have to get our hands dirty and that's gonna to have to be a priority. I, I challenge anybody to drive over there. If you haven't been to East Ridge right now, shame on you, shame on you. I, I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Brown. And the same question for Mr. Stanley, your plans to help our refugee population. Thank you, Penny. Um, trade schools, uh, I come from a construction background. Um, I can tell you that uh, um, we are struggling right now to find uh, good quality laborers. So we, we have subcontractors and, and good uh, workers that put ads in the paper every week at 15 to $20 an hour positions where we have people who show up and walk away um, or don't show up at all. And so we have a strong uh, growth and construction uh, economy around here. And if we will um, assist in that by helping with trade schools and helping to educate these people, uh, no handouts, um, no government funding, in my opinion, would be necessary if we will just take those who are willing to work hard give them the school, uh, the schooling and the skill set and the tools needed 
uh, to go to work. We have plenty of jobs that, that I know firsthand we need people that are that are willing to show up and work hard all day. So trade schools, I believe, would, would uh, drastically help that problem. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chuck Williams, KGNC, your turn. Thank you. <clears throat> to piggyback on that uh, last question that uh, Penny Commit asked, is there one section of town or is there a better place that you all feel that we could possibly build another neighborhood for the area? Not necessarily for the refugees, but for anybody naturally who wanted to live there, but would be like a, a, a plat that would be amenable to refugees. And Mr. Brown, I'll go with you first. So maybe I just don't understand that question right there, but to me, I, I feel like we're kind of going back in time when we start building neighborhoods just for a certain group, a certain demographic. It seems like we're trying to segregate individuals. Um, I, to a certain point, I understand what you're saying, but I, I, just, I just don't like the idea that I'm going to set aside a certain land for a certain group of people. I mean, that's like, I don't even like uh, veteran communities, that I'm a veteran, and I don't like, you know, plots of land that they say, here, here, this, you know, this 20 acres are solely for veterans. I, I, I don't even like that idea. I mean, there's, what we got to do is we got to find out, you know, how can we build, build these neighborhoods up, such as East Ridge, San Jacinto, North Heights and everything. How can we get them where they can fulfill the American dream. I mean, you know, there's a couple, I mean, there's some good question here. I, I, there's some excellent questions. And one of the questions that came up earlier about the socioeconomics, you know, with the socioeconomics, we, we got to teach people in, in some of these neighborhoods on how to be responsible for their, with their money, how to live the American dream so they can buy a house. Um, when I first, when I first, and excuse me for this because I'm passionate about this right now. When I first announced my candidacy, an individual asked me about the houses on the north side. I wanted, to, I wanted to build a house on the north side. However, though, when I got to looking at the price of land versus where I'm at right now, I took this because I didn't want a rundown, boarded up house down the street from me. So, and I love the idea that right now I can, I can buy a house anywhere in Amarillo and any citizen in Amarillo should have the right to buy a home anywhere they want to. However, first we have to give them the tools where they can afford that house in any neighborhood. And like Cole was saying, you know, it's, it's hard for us to find people that can do a trade. And maybe that's what we need to do on some of the, no, that's what we need to do on some of these uh, low-income neighborhood to teach these kids a trade is all right. Using these hands is honorable. It's what built this country. And we got to get back to it. I'm going to stop there because I can go all day about this. Mr. Stanley, same question put to you, sir. Yeah, Chuck, I know you, uh, you agree with me. We live in the microplex. And so, um, uh, assimilation is important. And, and when we say refugees, we don't say, hey, we want this particular type of people to come here and then we want to set you aside and, and kind of categorize you as different. We really want to bring you into our culture, into our community, uh, you know, show you our values, show you how we treat each other as neighbors, how we accept differences as strengths, um, not weaknesses. And so when we're talking about assimilating together, um, I think that uh, that does go against the, the direction that I would like to go. Um, I think that it's better to utilize the infrastructure that we have already current in our existing neighborhoods, um, reach out and grow these neighborhoods from the inside out. And so no particular uh, area zone or anything like that would be um, my idea of how to, to properly uh, welcome and, and grow and, and become a, a stronger family. And Mr. Tillery, your impression, sir? Well, I agree with what, uh, what Mr. Stanley said. I don't think it's necessarily a part of designating a certain tract of land to build a neighborhood in. 
let's they they could easily be dispersed within the community at large to find success. And from what I saw in the military, in the Navy, with men and women who came here from other countries, who became American citizens, and then chose to serve in the military to defend their adopted country, I think once we got past some of the language barrier issues, we found that some of these, some of the men that, and, and women that I spent, I served with that I have called family, were some of the most brilliant minds ever. But people assume that they're ignorant because English isn't a strong language. So I think that we should address those issues and help them get past the English, the English language barrier first, have them in the community and start finding ways for them to find success. Trades are great. I saw that firsthand, college isn't for everybody, but some of these refugees who are coming over can do more than that. So let's find some uh, higher level jobs that they could get into and work on the English language barrier issue and find them to have uh, real success. And they need to have access to quality medical care, grocery stores, quality education opportunities. And that's why I'm against setting them aside on any particular tract of land. I'll turn that back over to Mr. Martinez. All right, thank you, Mr. Williams. Okay, uh, moving on to place two, uh, Mr. Jason Fogelsong. If you could change one thing in our zoning code, uh, what would it be? Well, that's actually not something that I know a whole lot about, but I do know that it, it can be kind of cumbersome to get, just from listening to Mr. Stanley, I know it's kind of cumbersome to get building permits and things like that going. So I'd like to find a way to streamline all of those things to make it easier to get started, to get going, and then find a way to come back, like trust, but verify, come back and check later and get started now. Thank you, but sir. For a specific quote for the code, I'm I'm not that familiar. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Joe West. Uh, well, uh, I'm going to be in the same boat as Mr. Fogelsong. Uh, it's not something that I've done a lot of research into yet, uh, but I do know uh, just from speaking to people that there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, inequalities that we need to address, especially for low income housing, uh, especially for folks that uh, typically aren't able to, uh, you know, move freely around the city or, you know, build the kind of home that they want uh, or for businesses that are, uh, you know, trying to address the needs of uh, low income housing or commercial businesses. And I, I think we need to uh, address that, build an asset map of the city, see where our shortfalls are and how we can address those in our zoning code. Thank you. This is Frida Powell. <clears throat> is there yeah. anything that you feel that we need to change in our zoning code? Uh, thank you, David. Uh, that That is a great question. And I will start by saying that, uh, you know, we have rezoning issues throughout our entire city. And I know, especially in the North Heights neighborhood, they, uh, that North Heights Advisory Association, they are taking on a rezoning initiative uh, as we speak. And so they've been working on that for about the last three years. But what I will say to that is our zoning codes um, have not been updated probably since, since 1968. So we have a huge initiative throughout our city right now where we are working on those codes. And, and also, our focus is our definitely on uh, customers, how we can improve that, not just in the but uh, throughout uh, all of our departments within the city. Thank you. This is Penny Commit, KFDA. Hi, um, I know many of our viewers, community members, oftentimes feel that there's a disconnect between the average Joe and elected city officials. So I would like to ask all of the place candidates, I'll start with incumbent Powell, how you will involve residents in the decision-making process, active steps that you'll take to do that. Okay, well, the, the first thing that I would like to do is just uh, encourage citizens to especially get involved, you know, before they even consider uh, running for office. But um, right now we, we have about 50 plus some odd city boards 
within the city of Amarillo that citizens can certainly serve on. And we're always, always looking for individuals to um, serve on those boards, to be a part of the decision-making process. You know, uh, we certainly en encourage citizens to come to the council meetings, not just when they have an issue, but to stay involved so that they are up to date, they are being educated, they are being equipped with the facts that, that they need. And, and then just staying involved in the community period, you know, and, and, and every, um, every community. So you don't have to wait until you get ready to run for an office in order to know what's going on in a community because those meetings are open. You know, a lot of those organizations in different community, uh, communities, you know, you can certainly be a member of those organizations. So there is lots of opportunity to get involved and be a part of the decision-making process. And you don't, you don't have to be number one on city council to, to do that. There are numerous ways to, to uh, be able to uh, inform yourself, inform your neighbors, uh, keep your friends updated. Thank you. And the same question for Mr. West, active steps you would take to involve residents in decision-making processes. Mr. West, I think you're muted. I think one of the easiest things we can do uh, as part of local governance would be to uh, bring the city council meetings to, to the people, uh, doing town halls, uh, Bringing, uh, bringing those city uh, council meetings uh, to their neighborhoods at times they can actually participate and that are easily accessible is one of the things we could do. Thank you. And I will finish off the same question to Mr. Jason Fulton. So there's all, all of my the predecessors, Mr. Powell and Mr. West both gave good, good answers. And I wanna build on that and say that the first thing is to get people involved. And I know the city council meetings have been in the mornings and in the afternoons. And I understand there's probably a reason for that. But a lot of people, especially me, can't go because we work. So I want to see those meetings moved into the evenings or held on weekends. And I like what Mr. West said about having it in different locations so that people have more access. I think that's a good idea. And there's nothing wrong with live streaming it, but I really want them to be in person where there's plenty of time for the public to comment. And also, um, it's really easy to create a Google form opinion poll and send things out to the to the community to ask questions and give them a chance to get on their Facebook or their Twitter and answer real quick when they have time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, uh, Mr. Willens. Uh, we're still dealing with police too, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I would just like to know what makes you the best choice for and the best candidate for what for the position you're running for in place too. What do you think your attributes are that make you the best out of the field? And uh, let's start that off with Mr. Fogelsong. Well, I think I'm the best because I'm me. And to, to really to say that I'm better than the other two candidates, I don't want to run anybody down. I'm honest, I'm going to do my best to be transparent and reflect the community that elects me if they choose me. And I'm not afraid to admit that I don't know something or own up to it when I make a mistake. Like when I said earlier, like the mayor pointed out, not everybody lives in the south, southwest side. Hey, I stand corrected. I'm okay with, with backtracking and fixing things. And I want to hear from the people directly. And I haven't done as much as some others have to be involved in the community, but I do teach and I do, a v I, well, COVID kind of ruined it. But I do go out and do political events and things like that. And I'd like to be more involved with more people beyond just say Republican party politics. So I wanna be available and I'm just, I'm here for you. I wanna hear from the people. Mr. West, same question to you. What makes you think you're the, uh, you're the candidate, the best candidate for place two? Uh, I I think if you talk to anybody that knows me, they'll tell you just how far I'm willing to go to, uh, you know, be helpful and be useful and be their advocate. Uh, and I'm going to do the same thing on city on city council. Uh, it's not going to 
you know, I'm not going to limit it to anyone. I've already given out my phone number and my email address to for everybody that wants to contact me and ask questions. And if they need help right now, I'll help in any way I can. And that's not going to stop. And for the our incumbent, Ms. Frida Powell, would you please answer that, please? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I will just tell you that I'm, maybe I've spent, uh, I would say, two years in the Amarillo community. And so since the late 80s, early 80s, I have been volunteering on various, various boards throughout our city as far as nonprofit is concerned and then also government related. I have uh, worked to prepare myself before serving on city council. I would attend the city council meetings all the time. I was involved on city boards the majority of the time as well. Um, I, I purposely and myself and every community in Amarillo and I attend many, many, many meetings. So uh, as, as an incumbent, you know, now being four years on city council, I am very transparent. I'm very approachable. Um, I'm very professional. Uh, I respect others. Uh, I care about my reputation. I care about my credibility. And I try to exhibit that every day. But at the end of the day, for me, it always starts at home and how you are raised. And so I have tried to be a great role model, not only for our citizens, but for our young individuals, you know, that are going to come after. So I hope that I'm a good example. I hope that I'm doing a great job. And that's my focus is, is you know, caring the entire system world. Thank you. Okay, moving right along, place three, uh, Mr. Tom Sherlin. Um, where is your favorite place to spend time in Amarillo? I love to spend time in our city parks around different <clears throat> neighborhoods. I love, I, I love to walk. And I walk in different neighborhoods in the community, get out and meet people as I walk by and things like that. I really enjoy going to the libraries here in town. And as well as I love all the different uh, homegrown restaurants we have in town. Those are the things I enjoy doing. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Eddie Sauer, where's your favorite place to spend time in our city? Honestly, the very favorite place to spend time is going to be with my wife. Uh, we spend a lot of time here at home. We've made uh, our home in Bivens a place where uh, we like to spend time with our friends and we do things uh, that are uh, very much involved with our community through there. Um, we've got several different restaurants that we love to go eat at. Uh, one of our other favorite places is actually a little bit outside of town. We'd like to take advantage of Palo Duro Canyon. Uh, every opportunity we can. I mean, that's uh, probably one of the most beautiful places in the United States, and and we need to be uh, having a part of that. So um, the, I would tell you that those are some of our favorite places. We we walk at least three or four times a week, four or three or four miles, and uh, just out through the community, and it gives us an opportunity. Uh, the other day we did that, and we figured out we probably shouldn't do it on a Sunday afternoon because what was originally supposed to be an hour walk was about a two hour walk by the time we got through running into a lot of different people that we got the opportunity to talk to. So, you know, there's just, there's a lot to offer in Amarillo. Um, we've enjoyed whenever uh, Hodgetown opened and uh, we bought season tickets and uh, that's a great place to go and spend time with friends and enjoy uh, what the city has to offer. Uh, I could kind of go on. There's a there's a lot of places that you can go. And have a Thank great you, time. sir. Okay, uh, Mr. Williams, KGNC, take it away. Thank you, Mr. Sherilyn. <clears throat> uh, can you tell me why you're the best candidate for this position? 
Well, I can't honestly say I'm the best candidate for this position, but I will say I'm willing to bring new ideas. I'm com coming from a business background. I'm willing to look at new ideas, bring new ideas to the council and see what we can do to make things better. I would love to have the opportunity to listen to the people and bring their ideas to the table. I think for practically the last year, our council has almost been unapproachable due to the fact that of the COVID, which I think to the COVID, a lot of that was over-exaggerated. In my opinion, there is no reason now we can't be having meetings. You can have them six foot apart. You can have people there with masks on. I think sometimes the COVID has been using an excuse to separate the city council from the people itself. I have listened to a lot of the Zoom meetings that they have had. I've read all the agendas, but yet I don't get to hear much from the people. And I think a lot of that has been used to further their, to further their things that they want to accomplish. I disagree with it. I think we were talking a while ago about the COVID. I think for the practical purposes, they did a great job getting the shots out and things like that. But in, also in doing so, I think there were quite a few missteps, as the mayor said, but then there were a lot of great things they did as well. I think one of the biggest problems we had was allowing the workers coming in from the meatpacking plants just to be allowed to get off the bus at Walmart. And I think that's where our super event started from. And that should have been shut down. We knew it was happening two weeks before we actually uh, shut it down. The reason why I think I'm a better man for the job I'm not going to be a yes man. I'm not always going to say yes to everything. I'm going to analysis. I'm going to think about it. And I'm going to go to the people before I find out, answer any questions. Also, I believe the citizens should have the ability to vote on any tax increase instead of just being shoved down their throat from the council down to the citizens. I believe citizens should have a say. Take the case to the citizens. Ask them, do you want this? And here's what it's going to cost. I'll yeah. leave it at that right now. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, we're going to go ahead and move right along for the sake of time. Uh, place four, Ali Ramos, this is a yes or no question for you. Do you support the city of Amarillo's connectivity initiative to expand broadband access throughout the city? Yes or no? Yes. Mr. Smith? Mr. Smith? The answer is yes. And I'd like okay. to add that it started because of my connection with the real estate organization statewide that, that they're pushing broadband access. And so I thought we needed it for Amarillo. Talked to the mayor and mayor agreed. So yes, I'm very much in favor of it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mrs. Sharon Delgado? Uh, I am as long as there's no health concerns for our community. I think we have to look at the risk. And then if there's no risk to uh, being near large transformers and cancer producing or anything like that, I think we have to really examine that to make sure that it's safe for our community. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Richard Herman? I wouldn't support it. Of course I do. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chuck Williams. You know, in the talking about this uh, uh, broadband, the situation with the broadband, is it, in your my way of thinking, is this something that you can actually put on the table as feasible infrastructure to the city of Amarillo and not just to the schools, but all overall. And I'd like to start out with uh, Mr. Smith on that one, please. Uh, to answer that, that's still under consideration. The city has presented this concept to the school system and they uh, understand they uh, have either given or loaned computers to every student and they've set up two buses to be 
an internet place and go out to the, to the parking lot of the school and students can, can uh, connect to the internet there. But that's uh, the vision is to make this available for everybody and the, the internet providers have tended to not do that in North Amarillo, Northeast Amarillo. And so if we can make that available, and so the, it's gonna take a, a lot of support from other entities to make it happen. But yes, it's very feasible that it could be even up and working in August or September, possibly. Ms. Ramos, could you go ahead and answer, answer that same question for me, please? Yeah, I believe that all students should have the access to technology. So from what I've read uh, regarding what's the broadband connectivity plan, I do, you know, I do support it. I think that um, I, I think that, you know, the, the base of education right now with the pandemic is uh, tech, uh, it's all technology and virtual and I, I am in support. Mr. Herman, uh, I'd like to put that same question to you. Do you feel that this, that the broadband issue would be, uh, should be considered as part of the infrastructure system of the city? I absolutely think this was the greatest idea I've heard come out of the city in a while. Uh, COVID was a perfect example. You know, the kids trying to do online education and everything. A lot of people didn't have the internet. And uh, this, uh, like Howard said, uh, I wasn't even aware of all the problems with the internet service and not being available to everybody. And I was in a uh, real estate meeting is when uh, someone asked me about it. That was like a year and a half, two years ago. And, uh, this is very doable. It's it's not going to be hard to implement. Uh, there are some areas I do believe that will be a challenge just because of some of the things uh, that have to be done. But, you know, that's the beauty. We got guys like Cole down here running and Gunny, and we, we have a whole bunch of uh, diversity in this whole deal. And I think with all the talent just on this screen, I could care less if I win or lose this election. I think Howard's done a great job. I just thought he was retiring. <laughs> but anyway, I appreciate you and I think it's definitely able to be done. And, and Ms. Del <laughs> Delgado, the same question to you. Sorry, I thought I answered the question on the the brand, uh, broadband. Uh, I do think we should have access for all kids. Jason and I are both educators. Uh, we went to, well, in fact, exactly a year ago when Amarillo was completely shut down, our kids went to virtual, so did we. We went to Canvas and started teaching. Uh, we still have remote kids that uh, as Howard said, the bus is in the community. And Jason and I will both tell you there was lots of kids who, that's great, but they didn't have the, actually the technology to utilize it. Um, so, you know, Tom, when you talked earlier about going to the public libraries, a lot of people use that for their job resources, how to find bus schedules. So I think that's making sure that we have places in the community like Wesley's or um, even our libraries for that technology if they don't have the actual computers. Broadband is just one, but like I said, I wanna make sure it's safe for our community that we're not just trading out what looks appealing. Thank you. Um, at this time, I do want to apologize to Mr. Um, Mr. Eddie Sauer. I, I did skip over you, so I am going to um, allow you the opportunity to go ahead and answer uh, the question, which I accidentally skipped. Go ahead. So you want to go, would you uh, restate that question? Okay, that was um, Mr. Chuck Williams' question. Uh, no, oh. I thought your question. 
Right, right. Um, that was, sorry, I'm looking back through my notes right quick. I think maybe it had something to do, was it about uh, why you would be best for this position on city council? Was that what that was? Yes, and that was, yeah. uh, that was for Mr. Williams. Okay. okay. Oh, that was for Mr. Williams. Okay, yes. excuse me. Um, so the way that I would answer that question is this. Um, I've been on city council for four years. Uh, I'm very passionate about our city. Uh, I'm very proud of what we've done for the past four years. Um, I think some of these things are, are really great that have occurred. Uh, there was a statement made about uh, the taxes. So the first thing that needs to be made real aware is um, whenever we, whenever I stepped into office, uh, the top 30 cities of, the, of Texas, we were the number two lowest. And currently we are still the number two lowest tax rate in the state of Texas. Um, our first two years, there was a tax rate increase and that tax rate increase was directed directly to the bonds that were approved on Proposition Proposition One and Proposition Two in 2016. So um, then the next thing that ends up occurring is because of those bonds, now then we have to also um, we have to put ten new firefighters in. We need to have three new animal control officers that need to be put in. Uh, to, and we've got equipment that's got to be in these buildings, and that's not paid for by the bond issues. And so in the next year, we then also then made a, there was a small tax increase, and that small tax increase allowed us to fund 16 police officers, allowed us to fund the 10 firefighter, the three animal control officers to make everything work. Plus, also at the same time, we are still adding on and paying for uh, the Proposition 1 and Proposition 2 that the voters chose for. Um, so when we look at this, we have put all of these things have gone in front of the voters, except for the, that small portion that was there also uh, to fund uh, redoing the uh, Thompson Park pool. The problem with the Thompson Park pool is we couldn't wait because it would have taken us another full year once we got a good plan, we would be, we would have just maybe voted on it last November instead of having it open for the entire public. And so that was a choice that is given us to make. And so it's very important that that be taken care of. The next thing is we can talk about the, um, the Civic Center. Yes, we did. We brought that to the public. So to say that, um, that we're making tax increases without going to the citizens is absolutely ludicrous. Uh, we have done exactly what they have asked us to do. And in moving forward, we will continue to work and strive and keep our tax rates low. We will work to bring more businesses here because the more that we bring in in sales tax revenue, the less we have to talk to our, pay, our people uh, in the city about what our tax rate is. Uh, as far as let's talk about the, the meeting part of it. Well, the meeting part of it is, is if you look at where we meet currently, um, there, is, there is not enough room to get very many people in there if we're going to consider social distancing. If you look at the dais, you can't even put the six of us on the dais six foot apart, much less uh, get the other people that need to be there. Because every uh, thing that is spoken of during our meeting, we have to have the experts from the city there to address any questions that we as council would have for them. So therefore we don't have enough room for everybody to be housed based upon our current situation with COVID and with social distancing and with wearing masks. So we would have to then go to someplace like the Civic Center or someplace like that. And we don't have the setup to allow that to happen. So the first thing that's gotta happen is we have to happen to what's happening Monday, which is it's being released that all adults will now be available to be able to have the vaccination. Once we get, six weeks down beyond that, then you will have been past the second one, plus two weeks, then we can start talking about, can we move back in and meet again? Because now we'll have people that will be vaccinated. So moving forward, there's so many things that we need, still need to get done in Amarillo. And, and I have that ability to help make for sure that we keep going forward. So that's why I believe that I'm the best for this position. Thank you, sir. And I do apologize for, for skipping over you. 
Okay, at this time, we are going to um, take um, some questions that we received from uh, the public, and we are going to have our IT administrator, Mr. Bill Glover, read those out loud. Thank you. And these were, are coming from our stream on our Facebook page, uh, MRL NAACP. Uh, you can join, uh, you can go there after the meeting if you would like to provide more, uh, more written answers or, or more thorough answers. Uh, but this, we will we'll make an attempt to get some uh, verbal answers here uh, just during the meeting. The uh, first one up is from Lyle Brinson, is asking, as the city grows larger, what can the city government do to reduce the food deserts here? Do the, does the state open meeting rules promote discussion, reduce discussion from the public during government meetings? So there's really two questions there. Um, let's, I, I think we've already talked about the Open Meetings Act and other questions. So uh, let's talk about the food deserts just for a moment. And I'd like to start that off with uh, Mayor, uh, Mayor Ginger Nelson, if you'd like to respond to that. Yes, great question. I just this week had an hour long, hour and a half long meeting with Patrick Miller, the president of the NAACP. Um, I asked him to meet with me and um, a local leader here in our city who works with an organization that feeds children. And we just want to, start conversation those conversations have already been started uh, what i told that leader was the last thing that i wanted to do was to come in and make things harder by creating a task force or um, a committee to look at it when they're out in the public doing the work day in and day out um, i learned a lot from that hour and a half meeting and i really appreciated president miller's time that he spent learning also um, the truth is that it doesn't necessarily mean we need brick and mortar stores to meet those needs because our world is changing and it's trending toward digital. So if we had digital platforms where people could access food sources, um, and that's what this organization is creating, if we as a city can close the digital gap so that every citizen has broadband access, then they begin to um, be able to access um, services that are digital based. So nonprofit organizations like the one we spoke to this week don't have to spend money building brick and mortar stores. They can just have a warehouse where they fill things digitally and it saves them money. They can reach more people. They're not as restricted neighborhood by neighborhood across the city. And the city can partner with that by helping to provide broadband access. So food deserts are real. We have them in our city. And I'm part of conversations uh, right now that are making big projects to work on this issue for bringing this question up. Thank you, Mary Nelson. And now I'd like to open it up. It, does anyone else uh, want a moment? Uh, we'll have one minute. Uh, we'll ask the question to one person, then we'll have a minute for any responses. Does anyone else want to comment on this question about food deserts? Okay, we can move on. Yeah, to the next. I, oh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I would like to comment. I I know that it is really difficult to find fresh food, and I know that Mayor Nelson mentioned that in certain parts of town. Um, I don't know what the development is as far as what's going on in the plans, um, but I do want to make sure that all parts of town have equal access to uh, meals that are not just uh, like prepackaged foods from convenience stores. Um, I know that some cities have like bus stop farmers markets, co-ops, uh, re recovering food wastes to provide culinary skills, which I know <clears throat> the um, new career academy, I think that there's gonna be a culinary program. So that's really exciting and that's my answer. Can I address that as well? Yes, can I address that question as well? Yes, please. Okay. Um, I worked as an architect for HEB, so I've actually uh, seen the construction of 14 of their plus stores, and uh, I designed several of the apartments in those in those stores. But um, I, I just want to say this is what this is part of a what a comprehensive city plan involves. It, you have to find out where the food deserts are. And yes, maybe uh, we, there are warehouses for food and we do it digitally. 
that's that's something. But um, a, a comprehensive city plan uh, studies all of these aspects. It's not just for city services, and we we just don't have that yet. So uh, I need to stress that. Thank you, Mr. Carnes. Anyone else like to comment on food deserts? Uh, this is Josiah West. Uh, I can talk a little bit about uh, some direct action things that are being done. I'm working with uh, an organization in North Amarillo, Black Momentum, to address, uh, directly address the food desert problem that is out there. Uh, part of the way we're addressing that is we're in the works of building a community garden to give free produce to families that are in need out there, as well as to provide produce at low cost to uh, local black owned businesses that are out there. I've also, I'm also in talks with several other organizations to be doing the same thing. I think there needs to be uh, a lot of direct action uh, on the parts of private citizens, private organizations, and uh, I think there needs to be efforts from the city to uh, to help with that process, uh, whether it, it is as simple as, you know, in incentivizing people being good neighbors in that way, or, uh, you know, helping uh, advertise and promote the efforts of organizations and private citizens in those communities that are trying to address food deserts. Thank you, Mr. West. Are there any other comments on food deserts before we move to the next topic? I have a thought real quick. Talking, li listening to um, Mayor Nelson's talk about the, the digital aspect of, of you know, a food warehouse where they don't have to build a brick and mortar store. I know we have Cornerstone Outreach and we have other programs that, that do provide help to people. And I know a lot of people in town work multiple jobs or maybe they can't get transportation or can't get away to go and pick up these food boxes. I don't know if, if the city would pay for it or if we use volunteers or have to find somebody else, but it's possible that this digital, this change to a digital platform would make it possible to have deliveries done so that people don't have to worry about not being able to leave their homes or not have childcare or missing work to get the food that they need. Thank you, Mr. Bogosaw. Do we have any other comments on food deserts? All right, moving on to the next question. Um, would any candidate be willing to restrict building permits in one part of Amarillo to get businesses to look at other parts of town? And I believe, uh, Mr. Herman, you've already answered this in text. Would you like to comment first? And... You can re-ask the question. The question is, oh, and I should have said, this is from Tara on Facebook. Uh, Tom, oh, no, I'm sorry, wrong one. This is from Lyle on Facebook. Would any candidate be willing to restrict building permits in one part of Amarillo to get businesses to look at other parts of town? I wouldn't be willing to do that at all. I think it's something when you go restricting, that's kind of against our constitution in the United States. I think what I would prefer is to see incentives to encourage growth. Uh, you know, we keep talking about the North side of town and everything. And, uh, I would actually like to see us chase after a large, you know, Six Flags, uh, something like that to be brought here. I mean, we have, what is it, five states that feed into the panhandle and everything. And I think we're ready for something like that. Or go to our existing wonderland and maybe get some proud investors. And, you know, just getting something like that in the community will actually improve the growth in that, that area, the north side. Uh, we've done a lot on the east side, I've seen. Uh, we've done a lot down 6th Street, but I think the area we've actually neglected the most is the north side of Amarillo. There is a lot of vacancies and everything. Gunny, I know you've seen it up there and I know Frida's seen it. And uh, I, I was going over to uh, see Mary Pride and it, it almost some of the area looks deserted. And I think uh, the tiers, uh, I don't know what they're doing with that right now, but I think the tiers was a, a great idea and a great program. And I think we need to look at expanding that maybe some more. Anyway, I don't, I don't agree with restricting permits. I think that's illegal. I, I actually, I think you should give incentives. 
hopefully that answered your question. And also point out that we're going to be ending at 1230. So we'll just uh, probably get one more question after this one. Okay, yes, I, I wanted to jump in there. Um, I don't think we should restrict. I think when small businesses decide to put their money and invest in Amarillo, then Amarillo has to invest in them. That's their choice where they, they locate. Uh, back to what Richard was saying about Wonderland. I think Wonderland is a wonderful a company that is invested in us. I think instead of like recruiting competition to our local places, we build in our communities. Um, I'd love to see uh, all areas of our town, Southeast, Northeast, Eastridge to grow, but we have to do incentives. We have to encourage people. And then we have to um, try and get our young adults to stay here in Amarillo to be one of our greatest assets is to keep them here. Thank you, Ms. Del Ms. Delgado. Is, are there any other questions on restricting? Um, I'd like to address it just for a second. Sir, and also I see your hand up, uh, Mr. Schiller, so you'll be next. So um, I think uh, I, I would be completely against us restricting permits. I think um, I'm going to agree with what most everybody else has said about that um, the best way to do that is incentivize that. And I, and I would tell you that right now that there's a lot of incentives that are actually uh, beginning to occur. I mean, we could talk about the businesses that have already started in uh, the, the economic development that's occurring on the north side of town. But honestly, if you'll sit back for a second and look at the economic development that has been established, you're going to find out that we are seeing that occur in all four quadrants of the city. Um, the first place that you can look at is you can look at um, the, the vet school coming in. And the vet school is coming in on that um, western side of town. And so that's gonna have a big impact upon that side of town. And then we go, we talk about where's Amazon. Amazon is gonna be on the northeast side of town and that will directly impact uh, businesses being able to be produced on that uh, southeast side of town, on that northeast side of town. Now then, if you look at the paper today, uh, on the very front page, they're talking about Kasika, the the cheese manufacturing, well, that is actually going to be on the southeast side of town. And so you can see that as all of these different things are happening, they're not being restricted to one particular area of town. And as these businesses begin to go in place and they begin to go in those areas, what you're going to see is you're going to see more homes being built around in those areas and you're going to see other businesses um, come alongside those areas that are gonna be supporting those businesses and then are gonna also be supporting those homes. And so I think what we have to do is we have to continue to draw businesses into all the different portions of town. I think that's the most important thing that we can do. I think that's how we uh, address this problem as, as far as uh, you don't restrict, you promote. Thank you, Mr. Sauer. And uh, Mr. Tiller, you had your uh, hand up and then Mr. Vogelsong, you'll be right after that. Yes, sir. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to answer this and share my opinion. I think restrictions on uh, allowing businesses to open just stifles growth and stifles entrepreneurs who want to start small businesses and remain in this community. I think that, you know, and I think I speak for everyone or most everyone on here that we would rather see promoting and incentivizing small businesses and entrepreneurs who want to remain in the community and restrictions that just, as I said, it stifles growth. So I would be completely against restrictions uh, of that nature. Thank you, Mr. Sillery. Mr. Thank you. Most of the other folks already, already said everything that I wanted to say about promoting and incentivizing and advertising that these, these buildings are available. And the other thing, if a building is less desirable for one reason or another, maybe it's going to cost a lot of money to rehabilitate it in order for it to be operational. I know restaurants have some specific health code requirements, but maybe we could streamline that process, that permitting and inspection process, so that people could get started, open their business, and then repair and remodel the building in phases in a manner that is still safe for the public, of course, instead of an all or nothing approach. Okay, thank you, Mr. Fogelson. I believe we're Just, out of I time. Say something? Um, let me see, Mr. Karras has his hand up, and Mr. Sherlin, I believe we're out of time. I'll go to Mr. Martinez. Uh, do we have time to extend to 
finish answering this question or? Unfortunately, we don't. Um, so with that being said, I'd like to thank our candidates and everyone who joined the virtual event today and uh, want to remind everyone that the Emerald Branch NAACP remains a nonpartisan, nonprofit, all-inclusive organization and is supported by our members and volunteers. You can find more information about how to help us on Facebook, Twitter, or on our website, www.amarillonaacp.org. I just want to say thank you for our candidates who, who made it, um, who joined us today. Um, I want to say thank you once again, and we appreciate having you guys on. And with that being said, um, thank you, and you guys have a good afternoon. Thank All right. you. Thank you, thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Have a good one. I appreciate everyone. you guys. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. David, have a good one. Thank you for having this event. Yes, very sir. well organized. Thank you.